more recently in Kosovo, Bosnia and Macedonia. And now in Afghanistan and Iraq. On parade this morning, this hollow square, as it's called, formed around the cenotaph. And among those here from the services, a small contingent of the second Royal Gurkha Rifles. One of their comrades, rifleman Yubraj Rai, was killed only last week in Afghanistan. As they come on parade, the Royal Navy and the other armed services have been applauded by a large crowd that's gathered round them. And this morning of remembrance begins with the mass bands of the household division who play under the direction of Colonel Graham Jones, starting with Rule Britannia. flowers of the forest. The flowers of the forest are all withered away. The pride of our land lies cold in the clay. The words of the poem that gives its name to this piper's lament. Now from Edward Elgar's Enigma Variations, Nimrod.
And after Elgar's Nimrod, the bands now play Dido's Lament by Henry Purcell. Cross leads the clergy and choir out into Whitehall for the short service that follows the two-minute silence. The cross bearer leads the children and behind them the gentlemen of the Chapel Royal at St. James's, the sergeant of the vestry, the forces chaplain, the sub-dean of the Chapel's Royal and the Bishop of London, Richard Charters. There followed by the Major General commanding the Household Division and his procession. Major General William Cubitt, his Chief of Staff, Colonel Cowan, his aide-de-camp, Captain Oakley. Then the Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, and David Cameron, leader of the Conservatives, leader of the Opposition, each carrying the wreath that they will lay. Nick Clegg, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, to the right of David Cameron. Peter Robinson, leader of the Democratic Unionists from Northern Ireland. Elfin Fluid for Clyde Cymru, also on behalf of the SNP and David Miliband, Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs. After the politicians, the Chief of the Defence Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Jock Stirrup, the First Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Jonathan Band, the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Richard Dannett, the Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Glenn Torpy, and behind them the Merchant and Civilian Services representatives, and 44 High Commissioners or Acting High Commissioners from the Old Empire, now the Commonwealth countries who fought in both world wars. Nearly three million in the first and five million in the second. And before the royal family, the representatives of many religious denominations, the Roman Catholic Church, the Chief Rabbi, the Free Church, the Buddhists, the Methodists, the Muslims, the United Reformed Church, Hindu temples, the Baptist Union, the Sikhs, the General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches, and the Salvation Army and the Greek Orthodox Church, all represented here. figure of John Major on the left there and between Gordon Brown and David Cameron Baroness Thatcher Tony Blair would have been here today as a former Prime Minister but is engaged on the quartet discussions in the Middle East and so not able to be here the new Mayor of London Boris Johnson standing behind the Foreign Secretary
in the balcony, the Duchess of Cornwall and the Countess of Wessex watching these proceedings. The Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince of Wales in the uniform of the Royal Air Force and Air Chief Marshal. It's the 90th anniversary of the Royal Air Force this year. Now Whitehall is quiet. We wait for Big Ben to strike 11 and the King's Troop on horse guards to fire one round to mark the start of the two minute silence. The Royal Marine Buglers sound the last post and how still everyone in Whitehall stands. The Queen on behalf of the whole nation now lays her wreath at the Cenotaph.
the other members of the royal family here this morning follow, the Duke of Edinburgh first, who opened the field of remembrance in Westminster Abbey this week, who himself served in the Second World War in the Royal Navy. the Prince of Wales. <coughs> Prince William who's serving as a cornet in the Blues and Royals, who's planning to train for work with the Royal Air Force. The Duke of York, who served in seeking helicopters in the Falklands War. the Earl of Wessex. The Princess Royal in the uniform of a Rear Admiral of the Royal Navy, who just last month unveiled a new memorial in Westminster Abbey to the 16,000 people who've been killed in battle since World War II. The Duke of Kent, Colonel of the Scots Guards, who this year visited them in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The bands now play Beethoven's Funeral March and it's the turn of the politicians to lay their wreaths. First the Prime Minister Gordon Brown The leader of the official opposition and leader of the Conservative Party, David Cameron. The leader of the Liberal Democrats, Nick Clegg. And he's followed by the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party from Northern Ireland, Peter Robinson. Laying his wreath on behalf of Plaid Cymru and also on behalf of the Scottish National Party, Elfin Clwyd. Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, David Miliband, with his wreath on behalf of the Overseas Territories, specially made up of plants representing the Overseas Territories. 
And next it's the turn of the High Commissioners to come in groups. First Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Ghana. The Canadians lost 65,000 in the First World War, 45,000 in the second. The Australians, 62,000 in the first, 40,000 in the second. New Zealand, 18,000 dead in the First World War, 12,000 in the second. South Africa, 10,000 in the First World War, 12,000 in the second. And India and Pakistan, then as one country, 74,000 dead in the First World War, 87,000 in the second. They're followed by the High Commissioners of Malaysia, Cyprus, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Uganda. In the First World War, in all, 10,000 were killed in Africa, a thousand who fought from the Caribbean were killed. The next group, Kenya, Malawi, Malta, GC, Zambia, the Gambia, the Maldives, Singapore, Guyana and Botswana. And forces from Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, not here because Zimbabwe is not in the Commonwealth. Fought with particular distinction from northern Rhodesia as well and Tanganyika as it was in the East African divisions in Africa and the Middle East and Asia. The next group to come out from Lesotho in southern Africa, from Barbados, from Mauritius and Swaziland, from Tonga and Fiji, from Bangladesh, old East Pakistan, from the Bahamas, from Grenada, from Papua New Guinea. And finally, from the High Commissioner's group, the Commonwealth of Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Belize, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Christopher and Nevis, Brunei, Namibia, Cameroon, and Mozambique, a late entry into the Commonwealth. Once the Commonwealth wreaths have been laid, the three service chiefs come smartly out to lay their wreaths on behalf of the Army, the Navy and the Royal Air Force. General Sir Richard Dannett, Admiral Sir Jonathan Band, Air Chief Marshal Sir Glenn Torpy. After them, the Merchant Navy and Fishing Fleets, represented by Captain James Hofton. The Merchant Air Services by Wing Commander Eric Viles. The Fires and Rescue Advisor, Sir Ken Knight. The Bishop of London, Richard Charters, now to the service. Almighty God, grant, we beseech thee, that we who here do honor to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the crown, may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude, that forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives, we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind.
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. to God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen. And so the service ended, the Queen and the rest of the royal party leaves Whitehall, passing through the Guard of Honour of the Queen's Scouts. And then as this slow ritual unfolds, the clergy leave their position on the east side of the Cenotaph. The politicians leave their Now there's a change in the order of the day because the state part of the ceremony is over and it's now the turn of the Royal British Legion who organized the march past to lay their wreath, their Marshal Ian McFadgen. Royal British Legion which is responsible for the welfare of those in the services and who organize Poppy Day.
the first time among these wreath layers the territorial army. They're celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. Still 30,000 strong, still fighting regularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. With them, the Royal Air Force Association, the Royal Naval Association, the Royal Commonwealth Ex Service League, the National Chairman of the Royal British Legion in Scotland, and the Chairman of the Royal British Legion Women's Section. The Territorial Army, particularly proud to have been included here just on this one occasion. As a tribute to all that they do. Many of them people who've served in the armed forces and then as we were hearing earlier go out to fight and also are wounded and die. Well, we wait for the start of this march past. Seven columns gathered to the north towards Trafalgar Square to go past this cenotaph, which has been the focus of national remembrance ever since there was a temporary structure built down here in Whitehall as a saluting base for the peace procession of July 1919. Ever since the first anniversary of the armistice, people gathered here at the Cenotaph, as they still do, year on year. It was in November 1920 that the permanent memorial of Portland Stone was unveiled by George V, and the body of an unidentified British soldier from the battlefields of northern France was laid to rest here in the tomb of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. And it was just after the First World War ended that the red poppy was adopted as a symbol of remembrance. It was a Canadian, John McRae, who was very moved by the sight of wild poppies that had grown and were fluttering over the makeshift graves in northern France, and who wrote, In Flanders' fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. Today there are still three veterans of World War I living in Britain. Harry Patch, William Stone and Henry Allingham. Two days from now on the 90th anniversary of the armistice at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month they're going to come here to lay wreaths. Now when I passed the cenotaph I couldn't pass it without... It, 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 it is something to me and I had to say and acknowledge it, which I did do. It meant so much to me. Well, I was in the reconnaissance corps. We were sent to uh, Normandy, and our job was to recce in front of the infantry uh, to ensure that they were never surprised or running into ambushes. I look back now and think, why did I come through it? Why did they get killed? Remembrance Day to us is every day. If we ever get together, we talk about each other all the time. We don't have to wear a poppy to remember them. We remember them. Remembrance Sunday is always an incredibly important day to me. I was only five years old when my father, Major Roger Nutbeam, died on board the Galahad in the Falklands War. So I grew up without a father, but what I did grow up with was the Falklands in the media and uh, everybody having an opinion about it. So it's not something that I necessarily had complete ownership of with my father's death. So Remembrance Sunday is an important occasion because it gives me some comfort to see the nation is remembering the sacrifice that my father made. During the recent operations I've been on, I've obviously experienced loss on those operations with some of my men, um, both those killed in action but those wounded in action. So on an individual level, um, it's a period when I can reflect and I can think back on those, those losses and the families that are still here today. It's important to me that you know, there is a national understanding of what we are doing. And of course on Remembrance Sunday and through the Poppy Appeal, uh, you see the nation understanding and reflecting on the sacrifice that men and women are making every day. Of course, for every soldier killed, there's a wife, there's a mother, there's a father, there's family, there's 
nieces, you know, there's cousins, there's that extended family. In terms of soldiers being killed, you know, Northern Ireland's been one of the, one of the worst post-war conflicts that we've been in. So there's an awful lot of people on Remembrance Sunday who are remembering their loved ones who lost their life in Northern Ireland. The music changes and the march pass begins. First of all, the Royal Air Forces Association. Now, some of these fought in the Battle of Britain as fighter pilots. Some will have fought as bomber pilots, the unsung heroes of the war, suffering the most appalling casualties. White caps of the Royal Air Force Police Association, known as the Snowdrops, being properly marshaled as they go through, led by Group Captain Scapelhorn. Behind them, the Royal Air Force and Defence Fire Services Association. Royal Air Force Ex-Prisoner of War Association here. Flight Lieutenant John Nicholl on the right. In the first Gulf War, shot down and kept captive. The Bomber Command Association, I mentioned them now. They lumbered across the Channel and the North Sea night after night with immense courage carrying their load of bombs over Germany. The chances of being killed were very high. 55,000, if you can believe it, 55,000 out of 125,000 were killed during the war. The British Limbless Sex Servicemen's Association, Blesma, men who've lost limbs, women who've lost limbs or the use of their limbs. It's a special fellowship that contacts people who've suffered that way and helps them to rehabilitate themselves to civilian life, led by a parade commander who lost a leg while on patrol in Northern Ireland. Then the Royal Hospital Chelsea, the first pensioners who arrived as pensioners in 1692, 313 years ago, and the Royal Hospital Chelsea has been going ever since. In these wonderful uniforms. Pensioners now of the Second World War and later wars. You give up your army pension and the Royal Hospital takes care of you for the rest of your life. The War Widows follow them, the War Widows Association, who range in age now from 19 to 105. And SAFA, the Soldiers, Sailors, Airmen and Families Association. The Gurkhas, the British Gurkha Welfare Society, who just won in the High Court the right if they retired from the Gurkhas before 1977 to stay here in the United Kingdom could affect as many as 2,000 of the Gurkhas. The Hong Kong Ex-Servicemen's Association, those working way back into the Second Opium War, believe it or not. The Ulster Defence Regiment is here. 197 lost their lives during the Troubles, 64 were murdered. And now the Royal Naval Association leads the next column. A nice touch, the Royal Naval Association, once you're a member of it, doesn't use ranks, it just calls each member a shipmate. And the 
the Merchant Navy Association is followed by the Royal Naval Air Crewmen's Association, led by John Sheldon, who took part in a helicopter rescue of 60 seamen from the HMS Coventry when it was sunk during the Falklands conflict. Behind them, the Telegraphists Air Gunners Association, the people who flew in the rear seat of aircraft from aircraft carriers protecting convoys. The Wrens, disbanded now because they now join the Royal Navy, or have done ever since 1993. But they became a permanent part of the Navy after the war. They've got 8,000 members. They served all over the place during the war working incidentally among other places at Bletchley Park on the Enigma Codes. Behind them come the Queen's Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service who served in every conflict since they were formed. They were the only service women to go to the Falklands. The HMS Cumberland Association, Commander Cook carrying the wreath. His father served on Cumberland during the Second World War. This famous ship that fought at the Battle of the River Plate when she made a record dash of over a thousand miles in 30 hours. It's still a record for a warship. And the Russian convoys, with their white berets who played such a vital role delivering supplies, not just weaponry but food to the Russian ports of Archangel and Murmansk when the Russians as our allies were fighting and suffered the most terrible conditions. The freezing cold and the fog and the ice and the snow and the storms and the rough seas. The next column is led by the Far East Prisoners of War Association. These are people who were held captive by the Japanese. Finally got recognition only a few years ago of a payment of 10,000 pounds. It was said in recognition of the unique circumstances of their captivity. The Burma Star Association. They were still fighting in Burma after victory in Europe was declared right through until the end of the war against Japan in August 1945. Their distinctive green berries with the Burma star on it. The average age, 84. A new part of this parade, the Queen's bodyguard of the Yeoman of the Guard. This is a bodyguard that was first formed by Henry Tudor in August 1485 at the Battle of Bosworth Field. They're not the same as the Yeoman of the Tower, they're the force made up of ex-servicemen who have responsibility to protect the monarch on ceremonial occasions within the palace. Suez veterans, you may have noticed that little badge with the palm trees on. The Suez veteran, the wreath bearer, comes over from Canada every year. And it represents not only those who fought in the 1956 Suez invasion, but before defending the Suez Canal. The Cheshire Regiment, one of many regiments from the counties of Britain, Sussex, Kent, the Cheshires, Gloucestershire, Berkshire, Wiltshire, the Sherwood Foresters, who over a time have been merged, but who still march as they were. The Cheshire Regiment, the oldest county regiment in the British Army. And the Maroon Berets of the Parachute Regiment. formed in 1940 by Winston Churchill.
fought in Italy and Sicily and North Africa and of course in the famous D-Day landings on the 5th and 6th of June 1944. King's Royal Rifles, who became known as the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Green Jackets, and then merged into the Rifles now. The Royal Scots, the Royal Regiment First of Foot, who merged again, mergers, 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 with the King's own Scottish Borderers to become the Royal Scots Borderers, wearing their distinctive Glengarrys who suffered terrible losses at Dunkirk. Many, many killed and many taken prisoner. The 1st Battalion of the Royal Scots pretty well removed from the combat at the retreat from Dunkirk. The bright scarlet caps of the Royal Military Police Association. They're in operation all around the world now, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Behind them, the Reconnaissance Corps, the Intelligence Corps, Royal Signals, and then the Royal Artillery and the North Irish Horse and Royal Irish Regimental Association. One of the few regiments that wears the Canadian maple leaf on its uniform, presented by the Canadians for their support at the Battle of Casino. And behind them, the Home Guard Association, unfairly famous to us from Dad's army, but people who would have been the front line if Britain had been invaded in the Second World War. They're followed by the Royal Engineers Association, who have a nice motto, Ubiqui, everywhere, because indeed they are everywhere. The Women's Royal Army Corps Association, the RACS, WRAC Association, which includes all the ATS as well, created in 1917 during the First World War. And they operated as everything you can think of, anti-aircraft command, but also drivers and orderlies, store women, cooks. And they were also disbanded like the Wrens in 1992 and joined the army directly, not as a special women's unit. The Pioneer Corps is here, the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, and the Bevin Boys in their white miners' helmets. And this year they received a special award, the Bevin Boy Veterans Badge. And for the first time this year, we're in the Festival of Remembrance. Remember, it was a lottery whether you went down the mines or went to fight in the front line. The Salvation Army passing through there. Famous for the provision of a bit of not just spiritual comfort but physical comfort with the Army Cup of Tea at mobile canteens during the war. Led to that old song, There's Nothing Like an Army Cup of Tea, which a spoon would stand upright in. And the Boys Brigade. All youngsters bringing up the rear of the procession here. Boys Brigade, which has its 125th anniversary this year, the oldest of the Christian uniformed youth organizations. Once again, in this, this ceremony that never changes, we've remembered the sacrifice made by so many over so many years, the dead, the injured, and by those who mourn. Here in London, the Cenotaph, and around Britain, hundreds of war memorials have been the focus for this remembrance. But these memorials only tell part of the story, as a great 
Greek general said two and a half thousand years ago, what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. It was true then, it's true today. And you can visit our wall of remembrance and share your memories at bbc.co.uk.